Good afternoon, HVAC family. So uh, we're moving into chapter 84, which is cooling towers. And so just a quick review on cooling towers. So we know those are used with chillers. Chillers do the same thing that any refrigeration system does, but instead of conditioning the air, we're conditioning water. So the, there's two water loops. Um, there's water going, there's a water loop from the EVAP coil to the cooling coil because on chiller systems, the chiller is in a centralized location like in a mechanical room and each individual space doesn't get its own EVAP coil, it gets its own cooling coil. So the EVAP coil in the mechanical room is, uh, is being cooled uh, or it, it, uh, it, it has water going through it. So the refrigerant is absorbing the heat from the water rather than from the actual return air. So boom, we absorb all that heat, we shoot that cold water to the cooling coil, and then that is gonna be your medium rather than the refrigerant going directly to your cooling coil. So on the other end of that um, system, the other water loop is gonna be between the condenser and the cooling tower. So that's where cooling towers come into play. The, the condenser is where we wanna remove all the heat that we just absorbed at the evap coil. So all that heat comes from the EVAP coil to the condenser coil. And instead of the condenser coil being located outside and being air cooled, it's also in the mechanical room and it's being water cooled. So it's getting cool water coming in from the uh, cooling tower. And then that cool water is what's cooling the refrigerant. So it's absorbing the heat from the refrigerant, shooting it right back out to the cooling tower where it gets cooled again. The, the same way a condenser would if it was outside. It's almost like a condenser for the condenser. So that cool water, that chilled water coming in from the uh, cooling tower is absorbing the heat out of that condenser and shooting it right back up to the cooling tower, cools the water again, comes back in and absorbs more heat, and then there's a continuous loop. So that is what the cooling tower does. So let's, um, let's jump into cooling towers. So, chapter 84, the objectives are explain the difference between mechanical and atmospheric draft cooling towers, list the different types of mechanical draft cooling tower, explain how cooling towers lower the water temperature below ambient, list the common terms associated with cooling tower operation, describe the Per, uh, describe the piping arrangements used for cooling towers, perform routine maintenance on a cooling tower, explain how an evaporative condenser operates. So cooling tower, schematic view of cooling tower construction. So a schematic drawing showing the principle of operation used by a cooling tower. The water from the heat source is distributed over the wet deck surface or the fill media by spray nozzles. Air is simultaneously blown over the wet deck surface to absorb sensible heat from the water. In addition, a small portion of the water will evaporate, which removes latent heat from the remaining water. The cool water is collected in the tower sump and pumped back into the condenser. So that's what you got going right here. The outside ambient air is getting sucked in by this fan. This is an induced draft uh, cooling tower. Uh, it's pulling the, the uh, air in through, and not the coils, though, because this isn't a condenser. So instead of pulling that water across the coils, it's pulling it across that wet deck surface or that fill media. It's coming in through here, and, and it's, getting uh so the water the water's cascading down the sides of the fill media on both sides as the outdoor ambient air is being pulled across and then blown out through the top where it's rejecting the heat so it's, it's a lot like a condenser it's like the condenser's condenser uh mechanical draft cooling towers um air inlet on a mechanical induced draft cross flow cooling tower water inlet and outlet piping so here's your piping system and then over here this is the air inlet so a mechanical draft um, tower utilizes a motor driven fan to move air through the tower the fan being an integral part of the tower 
Mechanical draft towers are categorized as either being induced draft, a force, uh, induced draft or forced draft. An induced draft tower is the fan, or sorry, has the fan located in the airstream, leaving the tower and in the airstream, leaving the tower or the outlet and draws the air through it. A forced draft has the fan located uh, in the airstream entering the tower or the tower inlet and then blows the air across the uh, tower. An induced draft counterflow uh, cooling tower, the air and water are, or they flow in opposite directions in a counterflow design. So this would be an induced uh, draft cooling tower and then this would be counterflow. So on this one, and they're not showing an entire diagram, but this is, the fan is located at the outlet of the tower. So the air is being drawn in from the sides and being blown out through the top. So that would be induced draft. This one will be counterflow because the water flow is going the opposite direction of the airflow. So they're going against each other. So that would be the counterflow setup. Typically, the water enters the tower at the top through a distribution header. The water is sprayed through nozzles in from the, uh, sorry, let me just move that up. So the water is sprayed through nozzles in the form of a shower, either by pump pressure or by gravity pressure from the water fill headers. So this is what it looks like inside. That's where the water uh, enters the nozzles. And this is the fill media right here. This is the plastic honeycomb type. So this one is going in a counterflow cooling tower. So the hot water uh, flows from the header into the tower fill media. This material is usually constructed of plastic or wood shells. The fill is much like a honeycomb found in a bee's nest and slows the fall of the water and increasing its uh, surface exposure. So the water just kind of cascades down the honeycomb as the air goes across it. And then this is the rack right here where the fill media would, uh, would sit. Counterflow cooling towers. So a wet sump has the basin located inside the tower while a dry sump has the basin located underneath the tower. The water then the water is then picked back, uh, sorry, pumped back to the water cooled condenser to absorb more heat from the refrigerant. So the basin is just where the water collects and on the, uh, on the wet sump, the basin is inside. On the dry sump, the basin is located uh, below the unit. Cross flow cooling towers. A slightly different arrangement is shown in, in, a, in an induced draft cross-flow cooling tower. So this is the induced draft. So again, we got the fan up here at the outlet where the water, or sorry, where the air is being released. So the air is getting pulled by that fan as it spins in across the wet media uh, by that fan and then blown out of the top. And then over here, you have your forced draft uh, counterflow, forced draft meaning the fan is in the inlet and then pushing the air out. And it's also a counterflow because the water is going in the opposite direction that the fan is uh, turning. And then over here you have a force draft cross flow where the, it's force draft because it's the air, the fan is still again located in the inlet air, the inlet air uh, stream and blowing across the wet media. And, uh, and it's going across instead of up or down like the other ones would. So that would be a force draft uh, cross flow cooling tower. Atmospheric draft cooling towers. So these are different. Um, this is not one that I've worked on in the field. This is, uh, these are different though. They don't require any fans or anything like that. So at atmospheric, sorry, an atmospheric draft cooling tower is also referred to as a hyperbolic natural draft cooling tower. 
Natural draft cooling towers rely on prevailing winds and convection currents to move air across the wetted media in the tower. Natural draft towers are normally larger than mechanical draft towers for the same capacity. A properly sized natural draft tower normally has a low operating cost since there is no power or since no power is used to move the air. Cooling range, approach, and drift. So the following terms and definitions apply to all cooling towers. Cooling range is the number of degrees Fahrenheit through which the water is cooled in the tower. It's the difference between the hot water entering the tower and the cold water leaving the tower. So that's what your range is. And then your approach. So the approach is the difference in degrees Fahrenheit between the temperature of the cold water leaving the cooling tower and the wet bulb temperature of the air entering the cooling tower. And then your heat load is the amount of heat thrown away by the cooling tower in BTUs per hour. It is equal to the pounds of water circulated multiplied by the cooling range. And then drift. Drift we've all seen before, might not have known what we were looking at, but so the drift is the small amount of water lost in the form of fine droplets carried away by the circulating air. It is uh, it is independent of and in addition to evaporation loss. Uh, for mechanical cooling towers, this will range from 0.1 to 0.3% of the total water being cooled. So basically, you're going to lose 1 to 3% of the water in your tower just from drift alone. So, uh, which is why there's always a source of fresh water coming in because you're going to be losing water. You lose water to evaporation, you lose water for drift. Uh, there'll be a float mechanism that will measure the amount of water. And when it gets to a certain point, it'll engage the, uh, the switch. It'll open up and allow more water to flow. So that's how you maintain your water level because you, you will lose water in your cooling tower. Controlling water cool condenser capacities. <clears throat> So a, uh, a mixing valve mixes hot water and cold water from the condenser with cold water from the cooling tower to keep the returning water from being too cold. So on water cooled condenser systems, a temperature controlled water valve that bypasses the tower and mixes cooling water uh, or mixes cooling tower water with condenser water can be used. With this arrangement, the desired condenser water temperature can be maintained. The temperature sensing element for the bypass valve is placed in the water entrance to the condenser. So basically, this three-way valve can be installed in some applications to monitor or to maintain the, the uh, condenser water temperature. So the water's coming in, you know, in this example, it's coming in at 95 degrees, and it's being cooled at this cooling tower, and it's going back to the condenser. Now, if that water is too cold going back to the condenser, then the, the uh, three-way valve will open up and allow some of this warm water to mix in with the cold water so we can maintain our condenser entering water temperature. Cooling tower piping connections. A typical mechanical draft tower piping arrangement to the condenser of a packaged refrigeration or air conditioning unit. That's what we are looking at right here. Water supply lines should be as short as conditions permit. Standard weight steel, type L copper tubing, and CPVC plastic pipe are among the satisfactory materials such a uh, subject to job conditions and local codes. The entire piping circuit should be analyzed to establish the proper location of valves for operating and, main, and for operation and maintenance of the system. A means of adjusting water flow is desirable. Uh, shutoff valves should be placed so that each piece of equipment can be isolated for maintenance. So that's important. You definitely want to be able to isolate the component that you're trying to work on, meaning basically you should be able to valve it off 
drain whatever residual water might be in that portion of the system and then do your work. So definitely you need, you know, a, a series of valves and a means to uh, isolate your components. So this is the system. This is how it's set up. So this is your cooling tower. Here's your condenser right here. So the water coming from the cooling tower is then pumped into your condenser and then it's coming in cold and it's leaving hot. That hot water comes right back into your condenser or sorry, into your cooling tower where it's cooled and then shot right back into your condenser. That is your water loop for your condenser on a, uh, on a cooling tower. Oh, and look, they even got some of the drip showing right there. Some of the water that you're gonna lose just due to the fact that that, you know, air is circulating. Cooling tower wiring. For small refrigeration and air conditioning systems, the ideal arrangement is based on a startup sequence beginning with the cooling tower pump. So basically that pump is first and foremost because we're not operating this compressor if there's no water flowing. So that pump and that fan are first. So uh, let's keep moving. So the starter controlling the fan and pump will activate the compressor motor uh, starter through an interlock. This method ensures sufficient condenser water uh, flow so the compressor, so that compressor short cycling is eliminated in the event of a uh, in the event of pump motor failure. So basically, if this pump fails, this compressor, you don't want this compressor running because then your hair pressure is going to shoot right straight through the roof and it's going to cycle your condenser fan off. It's going to cycle your compressor off. So to avoid that, it is it's it's controlled by an interlock. This has to be running first before the compressor comes on. So where are we? So basically, so in other words, the compressor cannot run unless the tower is operating. The tower fan is wired to allow cycling by a tower thermostat to maintain the proper um, condenser water supply temperature. So I'm gonna just make that a little bigger real quick. So you can see here we have our, um, our cooling tower. Can't see the fan exactly, but there's a fan up here. And there's our pump. So this is the starter for the cooling tower fan and pump. So this is first in the lineup. So well, obviously our power coming in will be first, but so this is our starter for the fan and pump. And that's gonna get going and make sure that we have water flow to our condenser right here. And then next in line is our compressor starter. And then once that starts up, then, you know, now our system is on, it's up and running. Now we got, now we're, you know, uh, pumping our refrigerant and actually cooling. But we do not want this compressor on if we don't have any, uh, any, anything cooling this condenser, in this case, the water from the cooling tower to cool this condenser. Because again, your head pressure is gonna shoot right straight through the roof. All right, moving on. Protective measures for cooling towers in cold weather. So a piping and control arrangement to provide winter operation. This arrangement provides an inside sun. During normal operation, the ambient temperature is above freezing. The water flows from the inside sump through the condenser into the tower and then back into the pump. When the thermostat senses near freezing water temperatures, the three-way valve is repositioned to direct the flow of water to the condenser or from the condenser directly into the sump, bypassing the uh, tower. When there's no flow to the tower, the tower fan is cycled off. So let me open this one up a little bit. So basically, under normal conditions, your water is going to come from your sump. It's going to get pumped to your condenser, out of your condenser to your cooling tower, back into your sump, and then it repeats. In below freezing temperatures outside, uh, your your water temperature coming from your condenser, or coming from your cooling tower, is going to get pretty cold, close to freezing temperatures. And as that almost freezing water is flowing, boom! This right here, your temperature sensor that's connected to your, uh, your, your valve, 
that's going to activate and it's going to tell this valve, hey, it's damn near freezing outside. We need to go ahead and close this uh, valve and bypass the condenser or the cooling tower, sorry. So now the water's coming from the sump, pumped to your uh, condenser out and it's going to bypass the tower altogether and shoot right back to your sump. And that's going to be your water loop until this guy senses a satisfactory temperature and opens back up and allows it to continue to flow the original sequence. All right, moving on. Fans, so you got a belt driven fan here. They're showing you the pulley here. This is the pulley, the part where the belt attaches to the motor or the, the part that the belt attaches to is the pulley. And this would be a belt driven motor. So basically this whole big fan, not this wheel, but these big propellers right here are turned by this motor over here by means of that belt. So cooling towers, uh, cooling tower fans are often belt driven. It is important to regularly check belt tension and wear. Vibration sensors will help continuously monitor the fan condition and provide a uh, provide an early indication of problems. Existing fans can be equipped with vibration sensors that can be wired back to the back to a continuous monitoring system which would be your interface here. So they're showing you a couple of pictures. Uh, this is the vibration sensor attached to the top of the fan. Now here's another one attached to the bottom of the motor. And then here's your interface. So that's what's you know communicating with the sensors, uh, letting you know if there's an issue or not with your motors. Cooling towers and evaporative condensers. So cooling towers are protected with wire screens to prevent birds such as pigeons from roosting in the towers. However, even the best screening allows some birds access to the tower. Often towers become, uh, let me just move that real quick, become roosts for large flocks of pigeons during the evening off hours. Unfortunately, when the tower is brought online in the morning, Many of these birds drown. Their carcasses are washed into the basin. This organic material can cause the material, or sorry, can cause the mineral deposits normally found in the basin during cleanup to become extremely nauseating. Better screening and more frequent basin cleanouts will help reduce this problem. So that's a common occurrence with these uh, cooling towers. So there you can see the bird screen on the top, but somehow, some way they get in there. Uh, in evaporative coolers, or sorry, in evaporative condensers, the hot gas piping from the compressor discharge passes through the condenser like it does on an air-cooled condenser, except the tubes are bare and no fans are needed. So that would be inside of this evaporative condenser right here. You got your tubes, but there's no fans, it's just a bare tube inside of this uh, condenser. So in summary, cooling towers allow the use of water cool condensers. They also cool the water below the outside ambient dry bulb temperature. Water used in circulated in a, water used is circulated in a loop. Water must be treated to reduce slime, algae, legionella, bacteria, and scale buildup. A small measure of water is continuously or continually drained from the loop to reduce the buildup of concentration or and concentration of scale forming materials. Makeup water is added to replace water loss through evaporation, drift, and blowdown. Most HVAC cooling towers are mechanical draft type. Normal maintenance includes draining and cleaning the water basin, adding water treatment chemicals, and adjusting blowdown and makeup. System leaks or pumping problems should be corrected. 
proper cooling tower operation will result in cleaner condenser tubes and higher efficiency. So there it is. That is unit uh, 84. Um, again, it is in your books. Definitely, you're going to want to read that book. And go, it goes a whole lot deeper than the PowerPoint did. And um, FlexiQuiz has your review questions ready for you. So uh, good luck. Happy studying. And um, I will see y'all next time.